Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Gramps. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2,264 of our trek. The purpose of Wisdom Trek is to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. We are continuing the messages I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This is the 16th of a 25-week message series covering the book of Hebrews. This message is titled, One for All, Once for All, Free for All. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you. As we continue our series through the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, last week we learned that to have hope for a future reward and peace and joy in this present world, we must embrace and embody the truth that we can escape tomorrow's judgment because today's sin is forgivable. Now this week we're going to explore the great benefits of believers because of Christ one for all, once for all, and free for all sacrifice. In our passage today is Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 18. It starts on 1872 in your pew Bible. Follow along with me as I read. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never be, never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they have not stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilt for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sin. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Well, first he said, Sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them though they were offered in accordance to the law. For he said, Here I am, I have come, come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Now day after day, every priest stands and performs the religious duties again and again. He offers those same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice, he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. For he says, this is a covenant I will make with them after the time, that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody's telling me that they're starving, do they go to a cookbook to satisfy their hunger? Do they grab this illustrated cookbook with its glossy photos and thumb through it and say, mmm, that looks mighty good. That's satisfying me. Now, if anything, ogling at these masterful prepared dishes presented in glossy color prints makes someone even hungrier. It doesn't satisfy their hunger. And when a person whose family says, well, I'll just read these step-by-step -step directions with words like roast or braise or saute or to bake. It can make our mouth water just looking at the pictures and smelling the food as it wafts up from downstairs. And then at the end, they say, after looking at the cookbook, they say, well, I'm fully satisfied now. How about some desserts? And then they look at the dessert pages. Does that do anything to satisfy their hunger? And that's the illustration we want to look at today. 
trying to be physically nourished by the recipes of a cookbook, or it's just as foolish as trying to be spiritually satisfied by the rituals of the law. And like the pictures in this illustrated cookbook, the law anticipates and points to something that is far superior. Just looking at the pictures, we can see what the recipes would make, but it doesn't satisfy us because all we're doing is seeing a resemblance of what the dish would look like. The law made people hungry for something of real substance, something that would last, that would finally and ultimately take their gut-wrenching guilt of sin and soothe their ire conscience with mercy and grace. Verse 1 in our passage today from the New Living Translation says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Just like these pictures are only a preview of what would happen if you made this recipe. But they won't do us any good just in the cookbook themselves. In this section of Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 through 18, we will examine the limitations and the purposes of the law and what it can't do and what it continually does in verses 1 through 4. We'll explore the contrast between the old co covenant law and the superior priesthood of Jesus Christ. How his offering for his body was one for all, once for all, and free for all in verses 5 through 14. And then we'll see the benefits of Christ in his person and his work for us today in verses 15 through 18. So let's start with verses 1 through 4. And if you look at your bulletin insert on the side, it says, one for all, once for all, free for all. This first paragraph there I've included in the bulletin insert. The author's thesis statement is summed up succinctly in verse 1. The law was merely a shadow of the good things to come. As such, it served as a valid purpose in God's unfolding history of redemption, but was limited to what it could actually accomplish. Just like the cookbook cannot satisfy our hunger, the law cannot make perfect those who draw near because of the animal sacrifices made repeatedly year after year. In the following verses, the writer proves his claim by pointing out the obvious inferiority of the law in cleansing the believer's conscience. Let me share another illustration with you that might help to drive home the point. Imagine a married couple that they have to run back to the altar to get remarried every time they had an argument. We'd be going back to that altar almost all, every day, wouldn't we? Or if they had to buy a marriage license or a, to find a judge and a preacher to exchange their vows every time they had some sort of break in their relationship. Well, thankfully, marriage doesn't work that way. It just takes one trip to the altar for the bride and the groom to be bonded together in holy matrimony. No matter how frequently or loud the fights are, or on the flip side of that, how excellent that personal com com commitment is or connection is, there's never a legal need to go back for a second ceremony or a third or a fourth. It's only if a couple is legally divorced and want to get back together would a second marriage ceremony be required. Continual marriage ceremonies would imply that they're in a state of being unmarried. In such a scenario, there would be no security. It would be hardly a marriage at all. And that's what the continual sacrifices portrayed. This is what it's like in that sacrificial system of the law. If the law had been able to perfectly and completely deal with that relationship breaking power of sin and guilt, there wouldn't have been a need for the continual return to the altar year after year, as verse 2 tells us. All the guilt would have been gone, banished when the blood was spilt, forgotten when the sacrificial lamb went up in smoke. However, the author was careful not to disparage the law. The sacrifices were not foolish, they were not meaningless, they were not sinful. They were, after all, created by God and served a purpose. But what was that purpose of the law? He says in verse 3, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Commentator David Gooding says, at no point did they feel that the price of the sin had finally been paid completely. If they had, they would have not offered another sacrifice ever. 
And he includes another illustration. After all, you don't keep paying monthly installments when the mortgage in your house has been completely paid off. That's not necessary anymore. You look at it, they're both an insert on that second paragraph. If the author of Hebrews could have used a bold font in chapter 10, verse 4, he probably would have emphasized that verse. It represents a clear and concise explanation for the assertion in verse 1. The sacrifice can never make up the worshipers perfect, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Underscore that word impossible. It didn't say it would be improbable or difficult or unlikely or rare. It says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Notice that it wasn't a, sin, a simple rendering impossible because of the death of Christ even. The context refers to sacrificial limitations that were under the Old Testament law. The blood of animal sacrifices has always been impossible to take away sin. They were never used to take the people's sin away. Now, if the sacrifices did anything permanently, it was a reminder to the people of Israel of their sinfulness. Just like the speed limit sign shows us what the law is, you only go 60 miles an hour. A speeding ticket, though, reminds us of our guilt of breaking that law. The law and sacrifices constantly reminded the nation of Israel of their sins. It brought them back to the reality that they were sinful and they needed a redeemer. Paul later wrote in Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 23, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. For everyone has sinned, and we all fall short of God's glorious standards. Now, in their old system of law, the net Israel's national sin accumulated day after day. So every day they sinned. It was building up to that day of atonement. When that priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer the ultimate sacrifice for that year of sin. But it didn't do away with sin. It covered it up. But the next day after the Day of Atonement, their sin started to accumulate once again. The cycle, the system of endless blood got old. There was no way out of that cycle, or so they thought. But there was a way out. In chapter 10, verses 5 through 14, tells us about this more in detail. Now, these verses 5 through 7 is a paraphrase of Psalm chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. The author of Hebrews contrasts that once for all coming of Christ with the over and over and over again sacrifice in that sacrificial system. He sets up a quote with the word, therefore. Because the blood of animals could never take away sin, the Son of God came into the world. He did what nothing or no one else could do. Ultimately, God doesn't desire sacrifices and offerings as a means for a complete cleansing and total forgiveness, as chapter, verse 5 tells us. And this thought is paralleled in verse 6 of this chapter. chapter. For eternal salvation, God took no pleasure in the endless line of smoke that as ascended to the altar from the altar as the priests carried out their prescribed sacrifices. This passage presents a compelling contrast between two sacrificial systems. Under the old system, the shed blood and that burnt carcass of that brute beast brought no lasting satisfaction to God. The death of the animal on the physical altar of sins committed under the earthly covenant had no effect for the spiritual guilt of sin before a holy God. When it came to the animal sacrifices, the priests were offered against their own will. Now, at best, the animals would stand there in ignorance and submit to that knife thrash, slashing their throats in sacrifice. In fact, under the system, even the worshipers or the priest could go through this 
rite of sacrifice without mindfulness, without emotion, without will. The monotonous routines can reduce, be reduced a meaningful rite to a mindless ritual. And here, the contrast with Christ stands out. With God's Son, a real will was involved, a truly human choice, and submitted obediently to the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 26, verse 42, Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, that night in which he stood trial, right before his trial, and he prayed. Then Jesus left a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away, unless I drink it, your will be done. He willingly became our sacrifice for sin. And of course, for there to be truly a human person with a mind and an emotion and a will who would voluntarily submit to God, the divine son had to take on true humanity. He had to become human in all his essence. In verse 5, the author paraphrased Psalm chapter 40, verse 6, where he says, Psalm chapter 40, verse 6 says, My ears have opened expanding, he expanded it in this verse to the whole part of the body. He says, my body you have prepared for me. The author isn't playing fast and loose with the text here. He's actually using the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which we call the Septuagint, which replaced the word ears with the word body or whole. He replaced a part with the whole. He did so with good reason. For the Son of God to have real ears, to be open to receive God's word of in command, he had to have a body. So he expanded that to include his entire person. Another commentator, commentator by the name of Alan writes, only through the full incarnation of Jesus can accomplish the will of God to do away with sin. Having taken on full humanity in his incarnation, and his humanity included the body, the soul, the spirit, the heart, the mind, the emotions, and the will. The Son of God came to do, what God, to do God's will and fulfill everything that was written about him in the Old Testament. Verse 7 tells us that. In doing this, he essentially set aside the Old Covenant, the inferior system of the law and its sacrifices, and accomplished on behalf of humanity what no other human could have ever achieved. Complete obedience to the Father's will. Verses 8 and 9. What was impossible with frail, fallible humans was possible by a powerful, perfect, pure God-man, Jesus Christ. And Jesus accomplished the permanent cleansing that could never occur through animal sacrifices. Verse 10 of chapter 10 says, For God's will was for, uh, for us was to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. Now the author reminds us, his readers, that the priest must offer sacrifices continually. These sacrifices can never take away sin as such, and because of this, the priest had to stand every day to carry out the laborious, bloody sacrifices over and over and over again. In contrast, the priest to this priest standing ministry where they had to stand to perform these sacrifices. When Jesus finished his ministry, he sat down at the right hand of God because his one sacrifice accomplished for all time what could have never been achieved by those daily sacrifices. A complete payment for our sins is what he accomplished. And right before Christ died on the cross, as he hung on that cross, right before he gave up his life, he shouted out, It is finished! The sacrifice was done. The writer of Hebrews puts it this way in verse 14, For one, by one sacrifice he made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Now Christ is enthroned at the right hand of the Father, waiting for the second coming when he'll return to earth, when his enemies will ultimately be defeated in judgment, and the kingdom of God will be manifested in the fullness as he establishes this kingdom here on earth. He establishes that new global Eden, not a small garden in one part of the world, but as the entire globe becomes a global Eden where we will serve with him for all eternity in heaven and earth combined. 
That's what Christ will do once he gets back up from his right, the right hand of the Father. Now, verses 15 through 18, finally, the author points out the benefits of Christ's superior priesthood. He returns to the language of the new covenant and reminds us of the readers that Christ has accomplished through this once-for-all sacrifice for sin. In verse 15, it says, The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. That is, to believers that the new arrangement will put the law in their hearts and in our minds. In verse 16, signifying an internal transformation of an eternal effects. The sin will be forgiven and remembered no more, as it says in verse 17. And it's hard for us to grasp because we know we fail at times. But before God's eyes, he sees us through Jesus Christ and he sees none of our sins. He'll remember them no more. The new arrangement made possible through Christ brings all the necessary resources and places them within us. As the Apostle Peter put it in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Everything we need. We don't need anything other than what God's given us in his word. The sin issue has been destroyed and the relationship with God that hindered was hindered by hindered our spiritual growth and our righteousness has been dealt with. And the more than that, we have a new ability to follow now in Christ's footsteps. To offer our bodies, as Romans chapter 12, verse 1 says, a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. The Hebrew believers who had been slipping backwards into the old fascination of the law and the sacrifices need to be reminded of this limitations. They had to hear in no uncertain terms that the blood of animal sacrifices cannot take away sins because they were wanting to go back into those Old Testament practices. They had become dull in mind and they stopped growing. And that's why, as Paula mentioned, I think last Sunday after the service, it seems like every chapter is covering the same material in Hebrews. And in a way it is because he was getting through to these readers that we cannot go back to that old sacrificial system because Christ has done away with that. It's been perfect in all that he does. Essentially, we need to listen to the good news that the perfect sacrifice of Christ was one for all, once for all, and free for all. Now, if you look at your other side of your bulletin insert, the application for today, the application is that because of this, we have great benefits as believers because of Christ, one for all, once for all, and free for all sacrifice, we can serve God out of a gratitude of work, though his work and grace. We do not need to grudgingly drag our feet when he says go, or to cringe when he says come. The superior priesthood of Christ has ushered into a life of righteousness motivated by grace and not guilt. We don't need to live by that Levitical checklist of rules, regulations, and rituals brought to us by the law but the law of love brought to us by the righteousness of Christ. Christ bought us with his blood so he could free us from the constraining shackles of sin if we're using the law for our spirituality we're chained by the shackles of sin. But Christ has freed us from that. He says, take off your shackles. They're not needed any longer. The primary difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant is that now we have the law in our hearts and in our minds instead of an external standard of rules and regulations written on stone, as Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 through 33 says. The power of God's Spirit residing within us is sufficient for us to live fully, fruitfully, and freely unfettered by those shackles of sin that weigh us down. If we try to follow a set of rules and regulations to be spiritual, we have shackles around our ankles and our necks weighing us down. The primary difference between those is Christ has paid for those. He's freed us from those shackles. Let's look at each of these benefits of Christ's perfect sacrifice. The first benefit is, in Christ we can now live life fully. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. It's also referred to as an abundant life in other translations. The rich and satisfying life refers to a superior quality of life in which there is no comparison. 
Though the fullness of life awaits us at our resurrection, when Christ returns and we're united with an immortal body like the body of Christ had after his resurrection, even today, we can have a rich and satisfying life. We can experience that now. And I encourage you to read 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 this week and note all the blessings of that new life in Christ. And then in prayer, acknowledge that these blessings belong to you as you through the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The second benefit we have in Christ is we can now live life fruitfully. Peter wrapped up his litany of magnificent promises that are ours in Christ with the assurance that we would neither be useless nor unfruitful in our new position of Christ. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 8, it says, The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's focus on that aspect of abiding, the eternal work of that Holy Spirit, which produces fruit in our lives and the inner workings. And then take a few minutes this week to study Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 23. And then when you, as you do, answer a few important questions when you read through this text. What does the passage teach us about the Holy Spirit, the ministry of the Holy Spirit? How does this differ from a life under the law? And how does the fruit of the Spirit fulfill the spirit of the law? We can live fruitfully. And our third benefit, in Christ we can now live life freely. Galatians 5 begins with an important reminder that those seeking freedom under the law, the old law, in verse five, five verse, or chapter 5, verse 1, it says, So Christ has made us truly free. Now let's make sure we stay free. Don't get tied up again in that slavery of the law. Rites, rituals, do's and don'ts, these bring back, bring us a small feeling of comfort, but they don't free us. They're like riding the rails of a train track. And Paul and I, when we were in Alaska, we were able to ride the train up there. But one thing with the train is you never leave the tracks. It's not like driving through an open road where you're free to go where you want. Or even a better analogy is a pilot who can fly in the open skies practically anywhere they want. That is the freedom that we have in Christ. You can decide right now to let that yoke of slavery fall from your neck, not to be free to sin, but to be free a life of righteousness because of a joy and gratitude and the assurance of grace. Christ has set us free. We need to live like it. So the three benefits today is in Christ we can now live life fully. In Christ we can now live life fruitfully. And in Christ we can now live life freely. Let's live like it. Now next week Paul and I will be away at a podcasting conference. We're leaving on Saturday and be driving Saturday and Sunday to Denver. So do appreciate your prayers for us as we travel. But the good news is, John is going to speak next week, and he's going to do another character study, and this one will be on the book of Tim on Timothy, the character Timothy. And I'd encourage you to read 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 12 through 16 um, in preparation of next week's message. And if you think about it, on the um, 23rd, I believe it is, Wednesday, 23rd, Paul and I are doing a co-presentation at the conference. So give, uh, say a little prayer for us. Um, it's getting up in front of a lot of people is a little bit challenging. So just pray for us as we give that presentation. We might have an impact, not only for those who are there about podcasting, but impact for the Lord. So let us pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we can live life abundantly, fully, Father. We can live life fruitfully where the fruits of the Spirit pour out from us, Father, onto other people. And that we can live life freely not bound by the yoke of slavery, of, of the law, and not bound by the sin, but a life to live freely for you. As we go about this week, help us to keep these in our minds, that we might live a life that's pleasing to you, but a life that's abundant, Father, a life that's rich and satisfying, 
We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I pray that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's Word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend, as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek Podcast and Journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward. Enjoy your journey and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.